So uh, we'll continue uh, with uh, yesterday's introduction on BCFW recursion. Um, so uh, if you remember, so we're going to talk about BCFW recursion. Uh, if you remember in t yesterday talk, the idea was to deform your amplitude by a complex parameter z. Okay, and the deform and the, the way that you deform it is to take two legs, let's say p1, and make it uh, depend on a complex variable. So now p1 plus z q and p2 hat is equal to p2 minus z q. And we further require that q squared is zero and q dot p1 equals to q dot p2 is also equal to zero. Again, p1, not, one and two is just some arbitrary choice. I could have chosen uh, any other uh, two legs. Now, uh, again, the reason that I want these three conditions is because after this uh, deformation, I want to maintain such that my kinematic is still the kinematics of a usual scattering amplitude. In other words, my momentum is still conserved, so this deformation still maintains my momentum conservation, and p1 hat and p2 hat square is still zero. Okay, and as we uh, as we discussed yesterday, uh, basically this tells you that you have two solutions. You can choose uh, either. Uh, Q to be lambda 1, lambda 2, tilde, or lambda 2, lambda 1, tilde. And this and later on, uh, uh, once this is uh, connected with the on-shell diagram that was discussed uh, this morning uh, in Jake's talk, you'll see that this, these two choices basically correspond to the different uh, ways of uh, the different color of the two dotted, the two vertex that you, uh, that you have when you attach the BCFW bridge. But anyway, for, for us, we just know that we have these two solutions. And with these two, two solutions, uh, basically we get P1. So if I use these two solutions here, so then I get P1 hat is just uh, lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde plus Z, lambda 2 tilde. And P2 hat is just lambda 2 tilde, lambda 2 minus Z, lambda 1. Okay. Here for the second part, the second solution is just that this is, is the opposite. So lambda 1 plus z lambda 2 and p2 hat is lambda 2 lambda 1, uh, sorry, lambda 2 tilde minus z lambda 1 tilde. Okay, so as promised, you see that once I write it in this form, you immediately see that p hat and p, uh, p1 hat and p2 hat is basically still a null vector, right? Because I can still write it as a factorized two spinner, which means that the, the matrix is still rank one. And furthermore, uh, you also see that this is now a, a, a complex configuration, right? Because the lambdas and the lambda tildars are, are now obviously not complex conjugate related. Okay, so that means that you're really in complex uh, kinematics. Good. Once we have this uh, deformation, then we have the trivial relation that I, we wrote down yesterday, which is that the real amplitude is just basically your deformed amplitude with the, Z, with the z set at z equals 0. The statement that z is set at z equals, z equals 0 can be rewritten as a counter integral statement where I, we write it as a counter integral over dz over z and mn as a function of z. For now, this counter c encircles z equals 0. So in other words, in the complex plane, this counter 1, let me call it c1, is encircling 0. Okay, so this is basically just an identity. So my original amplitude, uh, the undeformed is just re related to this integral. Now, <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's okay. Let's put in the two by i here. Okay. All right. Great. So now we're going to have uh, this equals to. We're going to do the com We're going to do the counter deformation and deform this into the counter that encircles infinity. So this is going to be related to the counter over infinity, and the counter over infinity is now going to pick up. There are all the possible poles at the finite uh, 
uh, at the finite region in your complex plane, plus uh, possible contributions from infinity. We're going to forget about the possible com contribution from infinity. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this later. But first, let's just talk about what is actually contributing to the, these finite uh, poles here. So these finite, so the, here, if, I, if you look at this form, you see that, oh, the only, in principle, well, basically, you see that the poles should either come from this one over z here or from whatever pole that you can get from your function m n of z. Right? So since we already picked up the 1 over z pole in the original definition, now these uh, finite poles are basically the poles that are appearing in your function mn of z. So what are the poles in your mn of z? Well, we, the mn of z, uh, as we discussed uh, yesterday, any time n is beyond 3, we know that in principle the, the only singularities we can have, at least at tree level, is just we might have physical propagators. Right? These are the possible singularities you're supposed to have. Uh, at tree level. And therefore, that tells you that the, the finite poles, well, the, uh, these poles will, uh, will start appearing if, for example, let me draw this diagram. Let's say we have leg one here and leg two here and some external legs here. If uh, you, you start uh, hitting the pole that comes from this propagator here. Right, it's important, you'll note that it's important that I have leg one and leg two on two sides of this propagator, right? Because if leg one and leg two are on the same side, because of momentum, I mean, because of the fact that the way that it deformed this preserves momentum conservation, that means that there's no z flowing through this propagator, and therefore this pole will not show up, okay? So the only way that you see a pole in, in terms of this uh, z uh, parameter is if you have some diagram where 1 and 2 is, is on opposite side. Then once 1 and 2 is on opposite side, you know that this here you have a propagator where you basically have p1 hat. Let me just call this k, where k represents the remaining uh, momenta. And then you just have this p1 hat plus k, 1 over uh, p1 hat plus k squared. And now this gives you an entre a, a possible pole. And the good thing is that be precisely because of the way I've deformed my z by, being, by having it this, uh, being this q, where q is, is written in this form, here this is actually uh, a, 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 a pole that is only linear in z. So you, if you write it out explicitly, because pre precisely because p1 hat uh, square is still 0, basically you only get p1 hat dotted into k plus p k square. So basically you only have k square plus z times, uh, let me just write this as, uh, let me just choose one of the solutions. So I'm going to choose this solution for now. So then I'm going to have 1k2. Uh, okay? Or I can write it um, by pulling out the overall factor of, um, yes, uh, pulling out the overall factor of 1k squared. Then, okay, I'm going to write it like this. So you see that I have a simple pole in terms of a linear that is linear in z. Okay, good. So you know that what, what the poles are. The poles, each one of these uh, possible poles corresponds to a possible diagram that looks like this, where one and two are sitting on both sides. So we know where the poles are. If we know what the residue are, then we're done, right? Because then in principle, once we know where the poles are, then that multiplied by the residue is basically reconstructing this function that we had in the beginning. Uh, of, of course, uh, subject to this, the statement that there's no contributions from infinity. So do we know what the residue is? Yes, we do, right? Because the residue, when you're, when you're hitting this pole, that course, again, as we mentioned yesterday, that corresponds to this particle going on shell. When this particle is going on shell, the residue is basically the product of the left amplitude multiplied by the right amplitude, right? So you know that the residue is basically some mn minus q times some n uh, q plus 2, okay? Where q is basically some number that is greater than 1, greater or equal than 1, okay? Now, of course, uh, there's a little bit more detail into this because here the mn, so for example, the left-hand side amplitude is an amplitude that involves all these k on show lines plus a line that is one hat, right? Because, well, I mean, that is p1 hat. Now, p1 hat actually depends on z. But you know what to do, right? Because you're evaluating a residue. So this z 
you must plug in z equal to minus k square over 1, k over 2. So you need to plug this into here. So in other words, here you have the left-hand residue, and here you have the right-hand residue. In principle, there are functions of z because of that deformation, but the z is now evaluated on this pole. So this is just a, this is just a, a practical uh, detail that we're going to uh, do explicitly later on in the example. But what I want to stress is precisely because of this, you notice that if you introduce, if I plug in z equal to minus k square over this uh, angle 1 k uh, square 2, then actually there's actually, a, you're introducing into your amplitude a non-trivial thing in a denominator that looks like it can blow up on you. In other words, you're introducing a, a new singularity that, is pop, that might ha pop up in your amplitude because of this, this thing is appearing in a numerator, uh, in a denominator. And this thing that is appearing in your denominator uh, is not a physical pole, right? Because this is just some random spinner product, as we mentioned, that the only pose that you're allowed to have is something that is in written, uh, a singularity that is in your Mandelstam variables. This is not something in your Mandelstam variable. So by, by doing things in this way, you're actually introducing non-trivial, what we call spurious pose in your answer. You, you expect that the final answer we write down is going to contain these, uh, these uh, spurious singularities. If this gives the correct answer, these spurious sp uh, singularity must cancel. And so later on, we'll see that how this, non -can this cancellation actually points you into some non very interesting uh, geometric pictures of what the scattering amplitude is. Okay, but for now, we're just using uh, this formulation to, uh, to extract, uh, to give you a, a more uh, uh, efficient way of recomputing what your amplitude looks like. So we're going to directly uh, just use an example to show you what are the, all, the, all the steps necessary. So let's just compute the yang mills amplitude, six-point am yang mills amplitude with uh, three minus helicity and three plus helicity. Okay, so this is what we're going to compute. And basically the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to choose, so I can choose arbitrary things to shift. So I can choose this and this. Of course I can choose any, any other two, it's just your choice. And depending on the way that you choose, sometimes the computation can be easier, sometimes it can be more complicated just because of the number of diagram that is contributing. Okay, so but now I'm going to just choose these two, okay? So if I choose these two, as, as we said before, now the, f the, the original amplitude is going to be written as, I'm going to write it as the contribution coming from these poles. So each of these, uh, the, each of these poles correspond to a diagram where the diagram has the shifted legs on both sides. Okay, so, we can let, so let's start with just first writing out what are the possible diagrams that you can write down here with one and six on uh, two sides. And remember, we need to maintain the ordering because we're looking at uh, color order Yang Mills. So of course we can have this diagram. So this would be one hat, two minus three minus uh, four plus, five plus, six plus. So I'm going to put this hat here, just to label that I'm shifting these two guys. And I have this diagram, one hat, six plus, five plus, four plus, two plus and three minus. And also finally I have the diagram where the four legs are on one side. Okay, so in principle I have three diagrams. So according to the rule, all we need to do is just to glue the amplitudes on these two sides together and then plug in the corresponding z value and then we're done. We could compute the six point. Actually, things that are actually a little bit more better because some of these diagrams are actually vanishing. So remember, what, does, what do these graphs represent? They represent the residue that is contributing for these uh, finite poles, right? The residue, when I write down this graph, means that I have some amplitude on the left hand with the left hand multiplied by the right hand. Right? So that means it has to be a non-zero non amplitude. If the amplitude happens to be zero, then actually this residue is just zero to begin with. So for example, here we have here, I already have two minuses, so that means in the middle I, I must, I'm being forced to put plus and minus. Then you get an MHV uh, configuration on the left-hand side, and then here you get uh, an another MHV configuration on the, on the right-hand side. For here, then you notice that, that there's no way of assigning minus or plus 
such that the left hand or the right hand is non-zero, right? Because you already have all three pluses and all three minuses. So either one of these are just basically, on both sides, they're always zero to begin with, right? Because you don't have that tree amplitude. So that means that, in principle, that means that the residue of this factorization is just zero. So I can just drop this diagram. Now I'm down to two terms, okay? Uh, here, of course, I can just plus minus and plus, and then this will give me a part. This will give me another contribution. So basically, my computation now whittles down to two terms. And so let's just uh, do explicitly what these two terms are. Uh, is there any questions? Okay, good. So the, let me just go into the delve into the the detail. So. Uh, so let's do this diagram first. Uh, let me label this by P. So let me do this uh, here. This is P, and this is P here. OK. OK, so on the left-hand side, I have the MHV amplitude, which we, which we seen yesterday. So that means I should write 2, 1, cube, because 2, 1 is a negative helicity guy. Again, so, oh, I haven't specified which, which way am I shifting. So I'm going to shift, uh, here my shift is lambda 1 is going to be shifted, and lambda 1 tilde is going to be shifted into lambda 1 tilde plus z lambda 6 tilde. And lambda 6 is shifting into lambda 6 minus z lambda 1. Okay, good. So first the MHV amplitude, I have 2, 1, uh, 1, P, and then P2. Okay. In principle, I should, I should keep in mind that 1 is the leg that is being shifted, but because here I'm only shifting the lambda tilde of the 1, and therefore the lambda of the 1 is not shifted, so I don't need to uh, put anything there. Okay. So this residue is this multiply on the, 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 the amplitude on the right-hand side, which is just 3 and p. So I have 3p again to the cube. And then I have uh, p6, 6, 6, 5, and then 4, 3, and then 3p. OK, so we're going to compute this contribution. N now, excuse me? 3p to the fourth denominator. Oh, sorry. This is 3p I already have. So. Am I missing any of the P665? Six, six, oh, I'm missing 54. Sorry. 5443. Four, okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Now, but remember, now I'm shifting 6 lambda 6. So that means I need to put a hat here. Okay, so let's just keep, keep in mind that my lambda 6 is being shifted. So it actually has a z dependence. It has a z dependence, but the z is not, a tr is not an arbitrary uh, variable now, because I'm evaluating this on the pole in which p1 hat plus p2 uh, square is 0. So my z is fixed. So let's see what z is fixed to. So uh, we have p1 hat plus p2 is 0. OK, so basically this contribution is basically coming from tuning your z such that you're hitting this p1 hat plus p2 is going on shell pole. OK, so that determined what your z is. So if I, worked, if I expand this out and keeping them, OK, let me just write this out then. So this I have, uh, so p, oh, anyway, I can just write the lambda. So the p2 square is 0, the p1 hat square is 0. So all you have is just p2 dotted into p1 hat. So basically now, so the p1 hat is basically lambda 1, uh, lambda 1 tilde that's shifted. So you have lambda 1 tilde plus z lambda 6 tilde. And you're dotting this into lambda 2 and lambda 2 tilde. So that means you're getting 1, 2, and then you're getting uh, 2, 1 plus z, 2, 6 equal to 0. And therefore, the way that you're probing, making this uh, on show is basically your z is being set to minus 2, 6, minus 2, 1 over 2, 6. OK, so your z star is evaluated. Current for this contribution, your z star is evaluated, is evaluated at uh, this value here. OK? Good. 
Now, now we have that z star is evaluated at this value. Now we need to determine what these p's are. Okay, what are these p's? These p's are basically this, this, this internal momentum. But the, po the point is that the moment, this internal momentum here is now being on shell. p squared is equal to 0. So that, since p squared is going to 0, that tells you that p can be written as a product of angle and square bracket. Right? It's just a bispinner. Right? But we should be able to see that explicitly. Now, we already know that, so let me just do that here. Um, yeah, I'm going to push this upward. So here, my, so let's say, let's let the momentum all, the external momentums are flowing outward. So my p is basically equal to minus p1 hat minus p2. Right, so I want to show that p and d can be written as a, a by spinner. Okay, so p1 hat is just nothing but lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde minus lambda 1. So my lambda 1, which one is being shown? Okay, here. So my lambda 1 tilde is being shifted. So I have lambda 1 uh, minus z, lambda 1, lambda 6 tilde, and minus lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde. OK, so this is my p. I'm claiming that if I put z equal to this value inside to here, this thing I can write it into a bispinner form, because I'm evaluating z at such that uh, p1 hat plus p2 is actually uh, a null vector. So let's do that explicitly. So z, I already know it takes this form. So I, that means I'm writing this as lambda 1, lambda 2, plus 2, 1, uh, 2, 6, lambda 1, lambda 6 tilde, minus lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde. OK? Now I can use the Sheldon identity for this, this here, this 2, 1, and lambda 6. So I'm going to use the Sheldon identity, which tells you that 2, 1, lambda 6, plus its cyclic permutation, 1, 6, lambda 2 tilde, plus uh, 6, 2, lambda 1 tilde, is actually equal to 0. So that means I can take this thing here and then convert it into minus 1, 6, lambda 2 tilde, minus 6, 2, uh, lambda 1 tilde. OK, since this is, did I do anything wrong? Uh, let me see. Let's see if I'm getting a minus sign wrong. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so I'm going to put, so I'm going to replace the 2, 1, lambda 6 tilde by these two factors. So here I get, uh, I have the overall lambda 1 in front. So 2, one, two one lambda 6 tilde is now going to be equal to minus 1, 6, minus 1, 6, uh, lambda 2 tilde over 2, 6, and then minus 2, 6, uh, 6, 2, lambda 1 tilde. OK, I just converted this factor through the Sheldon identity, converted into these two. Now, of course, 6, 2 and 2, 6 can cancel. You just flip by a minus sign. So here, these two cancel, and then this gives a minus sign. Then you have this piece, lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde. But then you also have a minus lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde here. So these two pieces actually entirely cancel. So as you see, you're left with something that has an overall lambda 2 tilde here. So that means your p is actually equal to lambda 2 tilde, pulling out this overall factor. These have the same overall factor. So then you have, uh, so and let me put a minus sign, or let me put a minus sign inside. So minus lambda 2 uh, minus 1, 6 over 2, 6. Uh, lambda 1. Okay? So in, uh, so in other words, your, this is now your p. Okay, so now your p is proportional to indeed, as, you, uh, as we've seen, that when you're evaluating your z on this particular configuration, you can rewrite your p as a product of two spinners. And that reflects the fact that now you're evaluating at a point where your p is actually a null vector. Okay, p squared is equal to 0. Okay, and this also actually makes sense 
in, in, in which way? So remember that here you're tuning your kinematics such that this is a three-point amplitude that corresponds to a three-point kinematics. The way I'm tuning it to it such that this is a three-point kinematics is that my lambda two, uh, my my lamb, my uh, the lambda tildes are all proportional, right? Because here my p is lambda tilde is basically just lambda two tilde, right? And your lambda two, uh, the lambda tilde for p two is obviously a lambda two tilde. The lambda tilde for for p one hat is basically just what we describe here. It's, it's also proportional to lambda two tilde. Okay, and this indeed makes sense because for the MHV amplitude, it corresponds to the configuration when you require all lambda tildes to be proportional. And basically what you're doing is you're achieving that by tuning your parameter Z, this deformation parameter Z, tuning such that in a particular configuration you're probing that kinematic singularity. Okay? Good, but the, the whole point of me doing, doing this is really I just want to identify this uh, as my, uh, this lambda 2 tilde as my, my square p, and this as my angle p. That's basically the whole point of this computation. I've, I've identified, what, identified what square and angle p's are. Okay. So once I've identified that, now I can plug everything in. Okay, so now I can, so I know, now I can plug everything into this, th this form, so let's do that. Okay, so now I have one p, so I'm gonna just write everything. So again, my angle p is just basically that, uh, that, uh, that thing in the parentheses. So one p is going to be give me something like minus one going into there, but then one p, because one is lambda two, one is lambda one, the lambda one is not give, going to give you any contribution because it's just gonna give you angle one one, so that's zero. So all you get is just basically uh, one going into there is just giving you one two. So the first thing is just one two. So this is my angle one p. Angle two p, you get two hitting in there. Now you're not picking up the two, you're only picking up the one. So then you get something that is uh, again a minus sign to get you to a plus, and then you get uh, one two multiplied by uh, one six over two six. Okay, so I've I finished this part. Uh, I still have my 2, 1 cube on top. Now I need to multiply by this part, okay? Now again, 3p is again, I'm hitting into there. So I get basically uh, 3, 2 plus uh, 3, 1, 1, 6. I can pull out the overall uh, 2, 6. So I'm gonna put the 2, 6 here. I can pull this out, and this will become third power over two six to the third power. Or maybe I just put it on the outside. So I know I have a two six to the third power here. Okay, so this takes care, take, takes care of my three P here. Okay, good. Now let's do, go to the denominator. I have, now I have this, this will be a slightly more complicated. Let me say, let me just do this separately. So here I have p6 hat. What is p6 hat? Well, p6 hat, again, we have p is written up there, so I can write the p as uh, basically up to an overall sign, uh, angle two plus one six over two six, angle one. Six hat, because my six is being shifted in this form, so the six hat I have basically six shifted by minus z1. Now what is minus z? So z uh, was evaluated by minus 2, 1 over 2, 6. So this is just basically plus 2, 1 over uh, 2, 6. Okay, so p6 hat becomes, well, what does this become? So this becomes 2, 6, so 2, 6 plus 2, 1, 2, 1. And then you have this term. This is, of course, uh, over 2, 6. And then you have plus, this term is coming into here, so you have 1, 6, 1, 6 over 2, 6. And you don't get anything from the last term, which is just 0, okay? So you just basically get this term, 
and I can pull this, pull out the overall 2, 6. Let me pull out the overall 2, 6. So I have the, this one over 2, 6. Then I need to put this 2, 6 back into here. Then I get this form. Okay, so this is now what uh, this uh, P6 hat looks like. Now, the P6 hat, and once I con convert it into this form, you actually see what this is actually corresponds to. What is this? This is just P2 minus P2 dot P6 minus P1 dot P2 uh, minus P1 dot P6, right? So this factor is actually giving you basically P1 plus P2 plus P6 square. Okay, no, I'm still not in the denominator yet. And then this times uh, divided by 2, 6. Okay, so this is actually ans give, give, uh, give, uh, answering a question that you might have asked in the first place. And that is that remember that we're constructing the entire amplitude out of just these two graphs. Now, of course, this graph is going to give you whatever what corresponds to the 2-1 two, the two factorization. This graph is going to give you what corresponds to the 6-5 factorization. However, you know that if you look at this amplitude, this 1, this one 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know there should be a factorization pole that gives you 1, 2, and 6, that, that has 1, 2, and 6 on one side of the amplitude, right? And you might ask, so where is this factor, how is this factorization pole appearing? Well, it must appear if I'm giving you the correct answer, right? So indeed, you see that even though I'm looking at this diagram first, where I'm building everything out of just the, just the 1, 2 uh, factorization channel, and the answer itself, the answer in itself which contains this P6 hat, once you evaluate it, it's actually giving you precisely this P1 plus P2 plus P6 pole. Okay? So I can put this pole back here. I have P1 plus P. So let me just call this, instead of writing it out, P126 squared. So just remember that P126 squared corresponds to P1 plus P2 plus P6 uh, squared. And of course, I have this over 2, 6. So this uh, 2, 6 power is, d is, is uh, demoted into just two powers. I still have my 5, 4 and my 4, 3. And that's good. Now I only have to deal with 6, 5. So what is 6, 5? 6, 5, I can plug it into here uh, to uh, uh, here where my lambda 6 is shifted. So the, si the, the hat 6, 5 is just 6, 5 plus Again, I'm plugging in that factor, 2, 1, the particular factor for, two, for my z, which is negative, and uh, so that's 1, so this is 1, 5. Okay, again, I can pull out this 2, 6. I have to compensate here. This removes another power of 2, 6. And then finally, this power of 2, 6 here removes this power of 2, 6. Okay? Good. So this is the final form of, of the residue from that diagram. Uh, I, can basic, I can clean this up a little bit because here I have 1, 2, 1, 2, and 1, 2, the third power. So here I can just remove this. So I just have one power. And basically, this is uh, the final form you have for this residue. Okay, so let's, before computing the, uh, the other diagram, well, I mean, once you know how to compute this, I don't, you don't really, need, I don't really need, to, need to compute in detail the other. I'm just going to list the answer for the other one. But let me just look at this answer a little bit. So first of all, as I mentioned before, uh, it's actually producing the factorization pole that naively you wouldn't see, right? Because I'm just looking at the P, P1 plus P2 factorization channel. Because of the fact that I'm supposed to produce the correct answer, you're actually seeing that actually this answer now indeed gives me something that would re be required for the full amplitude, which is it has to have this 1, 2, uh, one, two 6 uh, pole. The other thing is also, as I advertised before, that notice that you have this factor here. Now, uh, now 5, 4, 4, 3, and 1, 6, they're all uh, valid physical poles, right? Angle 4, 3, angle 5, 4 are just corresponds to, you can just m make it into uh, 4, 3, put it in the numerator, then this is just S3, 4, right? This is just P4 dot P3. And that basically corresponds to the, the, the two particle factorization pole of 4, 3. That is, that, that is physical. This is allowed. This is also allowed. This is allowed. But you have this non-trivial this, uh, non uh, new uh, pole here that is basically unphysical and spurious. 
Okay, so this tells you, tells you that if I just had this answer here, this cannot be the correct answer because this has a non-physical singularity. In order, but you still have hope, right? Because there's half of the answer I haven't computed yet. So, so if I'm supposed to get the right answer, then it must be that the other uh, answer gives you exactly the same singularity so that they can cancel, they can possibly cancel in pair. It, it, I'm, I'm not saying that it's guaranteed to cancel in pair if, you, if they have the same uh, pole, but it's that at least it's possible, right? Okay, so if we now compute the contribution from the other diagram, you go through exactly the same thing. You just keep in mind that you're doing this shift, and therefore, you, you, therefore now you're looking at 6 being shifted. And you, again, you can evaluate what z is uh, for this configuration. Once you evaluate what z is for this configuration, you try to write down p. Now you write p equals to p6 plus p5. You're supposed to be able to, because p uh, now is on shell, you're supposed to be able to write it in terms of uh, two uh, spinner uh, products, then you can ident identify what is square p and what is angle p. And basically, then you just do the same computation, just plug in what the p's are and what the z's are. Uh, after doing all that, ex following exactly the same steps, the answer for the second diagram is just... So now I'm just going to write it out. Okay. So for the second diagram, it's just going to be equal to, I'm going to try to use consistent coloring, even though they don't have really mean, any meaning. So for the second diagram, it's basically just uh, 4 p 5 6 1 to the cube, 4, 3, 3, 2, 5, P, 1, 6, 2, and then uh, P, 1, 5, 6, square, and then 6, 1, 5, 6. Okay, so first, as, uh, as I uh, promised you, you see exactly the same spurious pose as you see in the first diagram. Okay, so the other diagram is uh, again producing this uh, spurious pole. And uh, so now you can ha have a possibility that this spurious pole actually have zero residue because the residue of these two, di two diagram actually cancels. Uh, you, you see that in the second diagram, now it's also giving you uh, the non-trivial three particle factorization for the other channel that you're not directly seeing in these diagram itself. Okay, just, and it's necessary to give you the right answer. And the re remaining poles are basically, the, re the remaining poles are basically uh, just the two particle factorization pole, which is consistent. Okay, good. So now you've succeeded, uh, succeeded, uh, sorry, succeeded in computing the six particle amplitude. Well, actually, not entirely, because I'm just giving you the residue, right? The residue is now multiplied by this, this extra function here, because you're really evaluating z equal to this factor. So you need to have this extra function here. But since w whenever you're evaluating z at this factor, this special function here, remember that in the front you also have this z factor here, right? So in total, you, you're, you're supposed to have this thing, the residue, which is given by what you've computed so far, multiplied by z uh, evaluated at k squared over the this, this spurious uh, singularity. But then you also have this overall spurious singularity here, which actually cancels. Right? So that means all you need to put in is basically just this k squared, the propagator. So that means that here I just need to put this diagram, gives the residue which is here, and then multiply by p, f uh, actually, sorry, uh, this is actually not the residue, I already multiply secretly, I already multiplied the, the extra propagator in here. So the p56 uh, squared already multiplied in here. Here I need to do, do uh, I need to multiply, Where's the final? Here's the final answer. So here I need to multiply the extra one two. So I need to extra multiply the extra p one two here. So I have the p one two square, and the p one two square is going to be one two two one, and therefore this is going to completely cancel this factor. So it's really this piece added with this piece gives you the final answer. Okay. So uh, as uh, noted, you see how how simple the how simple the final answer looks like. Right now it's just a two term answer instead of well, gener generically pages of Feynman diagrams. And it's just a very simple two-term two answer. 
So uh, we could stop here and okay, then just pack up and go home, and we basically have the recursion. We could code the recursion and we just compute the answer. But we want to, we want to uh, step back and, and look at this answer a little bit more carefully. And in particular, we want to s understand what these spurious poles are actually telling us. Okay? And more, more importantly, is there a way to actually see that this thing has to cancel? Or to visualize that these two terms uh, has these spurious singularity, and these spurious singularity have canceling residue. So can I make this more have a, a more manifest way? So uh, this is going to connect a little bit uh, to uh, Jake's, uh, Jake's uh, next lectures and also to what, uh, what's going to be discussed in Friday. And so I'm just going to lay a little bit groundwork for that. And to do that, I'm going to now introduce further new variables. Each time in introducing a new variable, remember that we're in, the, in the beginning we introduced the spinner helicity variable. It's just to, because I want to use only physical degrees of freedom. Furthermore, I can, uh, I can have my Poincaré symmetry and various extensions of my Poincaré symmetry uh, act on these variables. Now I'm going to use, I'm going to introduce furthermore a new variable which reflects that there's actually a more underlying symmetry, hidden symmetry under these scattering amplitudes. Okay, so Here I'm going to, so let me just call this, this part of the talk, momentum twisters. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, stop a little bit and think about uh, what, uh, go back to the very beginning and think about what momentum conservation is. So re remember in the beginning uh, when we were talking about three-point amplitudes, we actually s explicitly solved uh, momentum conservation at three points, right? And to told you that either the lambdas or the lambda tildes are proportional to each other, one or the other, and when you have complex kinematics. Now let's try to solve uh, momentum conservation in general, in general, uh, in, at general points. So we can think about momentum conservation as, so basically we have a statement of sum of vectors equal to zero. The same statement, you can also restate it as basically you have a collection of vectors and they form a closed loop, right? So uh, let's say you have P1, P2, P3, P4, and then P5, right? You can, you can state it as that they form a closed loop. So in other words, in a, instead of thinking, so remember that when we have a, our amplitude, we're talking about thinking about amplitude as a function of momentum, and the function only has support on the delta function where, where these things sum to zero. Now, instead, we can think of it as something that is a function of this polygon, right? Where basically you have, so where you have these uh, sum up to zero. Um, so a polygon have a description in terms of, now the momentum is just the boundary of this polygon. And instead of thinking about in terms of the boundary, I can also think about it in terms of the vertices of this polygon. So let me call this vertices y3, y4, y2, uh, Wait, where, what am I going? Y5, Y6, and then Y... So this would be Y1 and Y2. Okay? So as you, as you can see, the, there's a basic relation between Y and P, and that's basically you have Yi plus 1 minus Yi is now equal to P. Okay? So I've just... So in doing so, I've converted my amplitude, which has something that is delta for P multiplied by some factors, M and which is a function of p. Now I've converted into another delta function, where instead the delta function is just enforcing that the, these become uh, the after y5, y6 becomes to y1. So basically, y6 is equal to y1, and then my amplitude is now written in terms of y. Okay. Now these y are not really space-time coordinates because right they're just related to momenta, so they're not space-time coordinates. Okay. However, writing things in Y already tells you something, that if there's any symmetry here, if there's any symmetry for this function in terms of these Ys, that will mean that there will be a non-local symmetry in terms of the P's, right? because they're non-locally related to P. Right? So as we will see, that indeed you'll find that there's actually non-trivial symmetry in terms of Y, and that implies that the underlying theory has, has non-trivial and non-local symmetries. Okay? 
OK, so written in terms of, so once you have this y written uh, in this form, actually, because we know that uh, we're looking, we're going to look at n equals 4 super Yang Mills, you know you can, you're going to be able to do the same things with the fermionic variables. So instead of just the y variables, which are space time variable, let me put it index here, sorry, our vector variables, I can also define spinner variables. So let me put theta i plus 1, alpha minus theta i, uh, sorry, theta i alpha. Boy, I'm really running late. Uh, in terms of lambda i, eta i. OK? So that means my super function, remember that a tier I'm supposed to have uh, lambda, lambda tilde, and eta. Now I'm converting this into something that is basically just y and theta. Where here I have the delta function. I also need the delta function theta 6 minus theta 1. OK? And now I'm going to basically discuss what this function looked like. OK? For this function, so basically we already computed. So we can look at, so here I've computed the bosonic version of the 6-point amplitude. You can also compute the super, the super amplitude using exactly the same recursion uh, relation uh, computation. And Basically, the, the final answer you have for actually generic next to MHV, so here, because of time, I'm just going to list the answer. So for generic next to, next to, NMHV, uh, next to MHV, so the super amplitude for next to MHV is just going to be written as an MHV factor where the MHV factor is basically uh, just this delta y that I had before, the delta 4y, the delta 8 theta, and then divided by the spinner bracket, the Park-Taylor factor, ii plus 1. So this I'm going to separate out and then multiply by some j equals to 2 to n minus 3, and then k equals to j plus 2 n minus 1. It's multiplied by some function r and j k, where r and j k is just going to be equal to uh, y j k squared. I'm multiplying four factors in uh, sorry. J, J minus 1, and the N, Y, N, K, Y, K, J, J. Uh, and then I have the delta function, which is, well, first I have this bracket here. So this is actually ge the general form, and what is called the R invariant. So I'll explain the notation uh, shortly. And then there's a, sorry, plus theta kn. OK. So uh, basically, all I'm doing is just converting this answer here. So you have this answer here, which is uh, just in terms of the bosonic variables. And of course, because I'm computing a super amplitude, and therefore, there's going to be some eta dependence that needs to be tacked onto here. And then I'm converting it into this new auxiliary space 
where I have instead of just in terms of momentum p, I'm converting it into this y. And also in instead of just lambda eta, I'm converting it into this theta. Now, uh, of course, here, yjk means yj minus yk. So it basically means, uh, so if I have, for example, y4 minus y2, it's be it basically just corresponds to sum of my momentum p2 plus p3. So that's what the yjk uh, means. All, all of these are just differences of y, so they correspond, any difference of y corresponds to a sum of momentum. Uh, you ha also, you have similar, you have differences of theta. So theta, the differences of theta is basically just the sum of the lambda and the eta, which is basically the sum of your q's. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now I've converted that answer for a generic next to MHV into this answer here, which is now in terms of these, uh, these new variables y's and, and, and k. And what was important was that originally, uh, a little bit history, so originally, uh, in terms of these, in terms of these variables, it was actually already here that uh, th what is so-called dual conformal symmetry was shown, and uh, what the reason that is a conformal symmetry that is called dual is because it's really a conformal symmetry associated with this y space, okay? And these again, this y is actually non-locally connected, uh, related to the original momentum p. So therefore, this conformal symmetry that you find in this y space is actually uh, a non-local symmetry in the original frame. So that's why it's called a dual uh, conformal symmetry, okay? But as always, whenever you find a symmetry, you want to write it in terms of a variable in which this symmetry is manifest. And so we're going to try to rewrite this answer, which is actually a little bit, you might deem it a little bit complicated now, into another form, which, you, which actually makes this dual conformal symmetry uh, manifest, okay? So how much time I can I add? Who's it? Can I add, uh, probably, so I have five minutes left, right? Six minutes? Okay, so let me go to 35, try uh, to, is I it? Yes, yeah, so go for it. <laughs> okay, so, oh. good. Okay, so we're now, we're going to introduce what is called a momentum twister. So, as I said, this function here has a non-trivial conformal symmetry in terms of the y variables. So we're going to introduce a new variable that makes this symmetry manifest. So this new variable I'm going to, I'm going to call it z. Uh, actually, are you using z for momentum twisters? Okay, good. So I'm just going to call this function z. So the z is four component. Uh, so let me just use a, where a runs from one to four for now before making a super symmetrized. So here, uh, the first component, I'm going to just use the usual uh, SL2C lambdas. And the second component, I'm going to use what is called uh, mu tilde alpha dot. Okay? So what does this variable does? Well, for each variable through the instant, once, well, this is just four component spinner here. I'm just introducing some random four component spinner. But important thing is that now this, I can just add on another constraint, which is another condition, which is called the incident relation, where I'm saying that mu tilde alpha dot is related to lambda by x uh, alpha alpha dot times lambda alpha. So let's see if we do this. So what do I accomplish by adding this extra information? Well. So let's say if we have a given set, a given twister. So I'm just giving you a given four component twister here. Now, and I impose that all the x must satisfy my incidence relation, the, this incident relation here. Then if I find all the solution of x that satisfy the incident relation, actually what you find is you find that all of these solution of x actually sit on a light cone, okay? And the reason that this is true is because you can show that if x1 and x2 both satisfy this equation, that means that x1 minus x2 dotted into lambda, dotted into lambda alpha must be zero, right? That tells you that x1 minus x2 must be equal to lambda alpha times some other spinner, chi alpha dot. Okay, where then this, of course, this dotted into this lambda alpha is actually zero. Okay, in other words, given a, a, given, a, given a twister, add on with the incident relation, you actually determine x. You determine, you determine x not as a point, but you basically determine the whole light ray of x. 
Okay, they all light on the, the all of the x lies on the light cone. Now, so that, in other words, a point here maps to a line here in x space. Okay, to, if a point if a if a point maps into a line, if you want to have a line a point in the x space, you just have to have the two lines intersect, right? So that means that the two that for a point here, you need a line here in z. So so, so this you map you map from a line to a point, and you match from a line here to a point here. Okay, so this is uh, this is the, 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 the mapping. So, in other words, once you have this uh, incident relation, now you can write it using this to define my y. Okay, so I can now I can label this as lambda i, and I can define this as y. And once I have this equation satisfied, I must have y i plus one satisfied as well because they differ by p i. Okay, and similar, and and from this you can define, you can find that each y i alpha alpha dot now can be written as a bi spinner, lambda i mu i minus one, alpha alpha dot minus lambda i minus one, mu tilde i alpha dot. Okay, you can go home and work this out explicitly. If, if my, so in order to solve this these two equation, you can show that that tells you that y is, ex, is determined in this form. Okay, you can just t take this y in this form and then just plug it in and show that these two equations are satisfied. Okay, good. So that, that, just, course, that just tells you that yi is really a point and, and yi space is really given by two twisters, zi and zi minus one. That's basically just the statement, okay? So for example, then this function here, yjk square here, is just, if you use this, uh, if you again, you just use this uh, map here, you can see that yjk square here is nothing but uh, j minus one, j k minus one, k. With uh, j minus one, j, and then k minus one k. Okay, where here I have a four bracket. The reason I have a four bracket here is because remember that my z here is our four component. So that means it's natural to contract it with the four component Lovitch Avita. Okay, so that tells you that I have a four bracket. That's why I have a four bracket here. Here the two bracket is basically just the lambda i. Uh, the lambda j minus one dotted into lambda j. You can equivalent you can equivalent rewrite this as a four bracket uh, just by introducing the infinity twister, but uh, that that's not so important here. Okay, but so for example, now you see that if, since any propagator, so any propagator pole is always written in terms of y j k, right? Because any propagator is just a sum of momentum, so you can you can write it as y j k square. So that tells you that any propagator, when you write it in, in terms of this momentum twister, in terms of four bracket, is always going to appear as j minus uh, j minus one j and k minus one k, for some random j and k. And this is going to be important because that tells you what the physical single, what the physical uh, pose should look like. It's just going to come in pairs of uh, j minus one j and k minus one k. Okay. Good, so you have the y, j, k square. Now you can just plug, again, you, ha you have the explicit form for your y. You can just plug it into there. And then you, ha you also have, similarly, if you want to define what theta is, we can just basically enlarge this into fermionic variables. So I'm going to augment this by fermionic variables, chi. And the definition is, again, uh, here at chi I have, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, also incident relation for chi, and basically I just have, um, how am I going to write it? Um, yeah, so my chi is just going to be equal to my theta here, i a alpha dot into lambda alpha i, and equal to theta i plus one a alpha dot into lambda i alpha. Okay, so that means I can now write instead of in terms of this complicated form, I can write everything in terms of what is the momentum twister here, and we can see that the final uh, form of your R. Oh, this is completely clean. So I'm just going to write down the final form of your R. So R and J K in terms of these momentum twisters are extremely simple. 
So they just take the form of delta 4, j minus 1, j, k minus 1, k, the four bracket, chi n plus cyclic. So here, this is a fermionic variable. So cyclic just means j minus 1, j, k minus 1, k, n plus is five cyclic rotations. The five cyclic rotation also appears down there with uh, n j minus 1, j, k minus 1. j minus 1, j, k minus 1, k, and uh, j, k minus 1, k, n. And k, n, j minus 1, j. OK? Good. So now written in this form, you can see that, uh, that uh, there's an obvious symmetry for this answer. So the obvious symmetry is since everything is contracted by your four, four com component La Vicha Vida, that means that anything that is, any operator that writ is written in terms of this form zi a partial partial zi a, where I sum over i, acting on this is zero, right? Because everything is just contracted and then invariant. Right, this, these are all SU4, uh, four component SU4 invariants. And so any linear uh, derivatives like this acting on this thing is zero. You can also have include ver things like this, uh, ZIA and then partial, partial, chi i. Then this also acts on here and this is also zero because this is just a five component uh, uh, Sheldon identity. Okay, so you see that you have non right in this form, this, manif this already manifests uh, a non-trivial symmetry, which are now local in zi, but remember that zi is related to yi, which is actually non-local in the original variables. So this is a new set of symmetry. If you work out the algebra, it's basically the same as the conformal superconformal symmetry. And but this superconformal symmetry is not the original superconformal symmetry of your of your of the n equals four super YML, but a dual version of the dual, uh, of the the superconformal symmetry. Okay, so this tells you that there's a there's a, 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 a there's a new set of symmetry. And the uh, combination of this and uh, the old superconformal symmetry gives you generate an infinite set of, uh, of, of Yang-Yen invariants, uh, Yang-Yen symmetry. It's actually interesting to note that each of these, even though there's a symmetry of this theory, each of these things is actually already invariant by itself. Uh, and, uh, and each of the, in other words, each of these blocks are actually invariant blocks. They're, they're, they're blocks that respect the symmetry. Okay, you don't need cancellation between different terms to see that symmetry. Each block is invariant by itself. Furthermore, so these, now you see that instead of looking at things in terms of this form, now you can see everything universally in just the four bracket form. And you can determine which ones are physical and which ones are not physical by looking at, for example, this one is obviously physical because it's in the form j minus 1, j, k minus 1, k. For the other one, of course, now it dep depends on whether or not uh, what or your n is to determine which w whether or not they're physical or, or unphysical. Now, written in this form, so I think Nima will start talking about uh, uh, when you have it in this form, you can, already, or you can s uh, start to see that this is actually corresponding to the simplex uh, uh, in higher dimensions. And basically what you're seeing is that the BCFW is basically uh, some kind of, some sort of triangulation of some uh, polytope, uh, which will be th basically the main pr part of the main story that you'll hear on Friday. Okay, but here the purpose is just to show you uh, how these terms are computed in a traditional uh, BCFW way, and then show you what are the necessary steps to convert it into this form by introducing new variables. And once you convert it into this form, you see that now there's a non-trivial symmetry, and we'll explore these symmetry uh, further more in the upcoming lectures. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so Eric is our next speaker.